Hello, and welcome to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I am your host, Mr. Miller. This podcast will cover a number of topics that happened on this date in history. Please visit the podcast webpage at thishappentoday.buzzsprout.com. There you can download the notes page, which will help you organize the information, as well as develop your own ideas on how these events change the world around us. If you're interested in hearing more, please consider subscribing so you will not miss out on what happens tomorrow in history. Today is June 30th. The 1953 Corvette was the first generation Corvette ever produced, and it rolled off the assembly line on June 30th as a model 1953 year car. It was an experiment for Chevrolet, and it immediately caught the public's eye, yet it had some drawbacks. The 1953 Corvette has a distinct style that has served as the foundation for all Corvettes to follow. It will only be found in polo white, and its signature red interior is unforgettable. Yet we will not find many on the road or at auction because there are only 300 produced. GM's innovation, innovative design led to successes that few of the original designers and engineers probably hoped for. This icon of the car world is prized by those who own it. If you don't get a chance to purchase a car from this year, the Corvettes of 1954 and 55 remain very similar. The first prototype, EX122 Corvette, was unveiled at the GM Motorama Show in New York on January 17, 1953. Production began in the old truck factory in Flint, Michigan six months later. The 1953 Corvette was Chevrolet's first foray into the modern sports cars and was not well received. Just 300 Corvettes were made that first model year, of which about 225 remain in existence today. All 1953 Corvettes were painted polo white with a black convertible top and a sportsman red interior. The only options available in this year were single signing AM radio and a heater. Oddly enough, both options were included on every 1953 Corvette. This two-door roadster had a fiberglass body which made for a unique placement of the radio antenna. Unlike the conventional steel bodies at the time, the antenna was able to be placed discreetly in the lid of the trunk. The Corvette was not changed for the 1954 model year, though. The car would be ordered in blue, red, or black in addition to the Polo White. The 1953 Corvette came with a 150 horsepower blue flame inline six cylinder engine fed by three single throat Carter carburetors. The only available transmission in 1953 was a two speed Power Glide unit. While the Corvette itself turns heads, the engine left a bit to be desired, especially when it first sold. It would travel from 0 to 60 in about 18 seconds on the quarter mile. Early GM brochures touted the car had been clocked at more than 100 miles per hour in the GM Proving Ground. Drivers in the 50s wanted as much horsepower as they could get, so 150 two-speed engine was a deterrent for many. The engine remained in the 1954 production year, and in 1955, a V8 option, a three-speed manual transmission were available in the same body. This is when the Corvette really began to make a name for itself. Due to the low production, you'll be hard-pressed to find a 1953 Corvette come up for sale. Buyers who get their hands on one tend to keep it around, and the car's history is often well-documented, showing just one or two owners in its lifetime. In excellent condition, a 1953 Corvette sells today for $125,000 to $275,000. These rare sports cars have maintained their value and remained relatively steady over the years. And then in 1937, the first emergency number system in the world, 999, was launched in London. The 999 call system was introduced after a two-year inquiry following the deaths of five women in a fire at Wimpole Street in London in 1935. Neighbors were unable to dial zero for the switchboard, found it jammed with calls, and could not alert anyone of the fire. Prior to 999, people called their local police station to raise the alarm. Then dialing zero and asking for the operator for police, fire, or ambulance was recommended method from 1927. The General Post Office, which ran the telephone network, proposed a three-digit number. Initially, each 999 call triggered flashing red lights and hooters to alert exchange operators to give priority to the emergency call. During the first week, there were 1,336 calls made to 999. That number has grown to around 560,000 calls per week and more than 30 million calls in a year. Call handlers still manage to answer 97% of calls within 5 seconds. Why 999? Because the phones of the day had a dial interface. It was designed to make the numbers very difficult to dial accidentally by making them involve long sequences, but also easy to find by the blind, in the dark, or in thick smoke. 
It was suggested that using the end number 9 three times would be more sensible than using random numbers so it could be found more easily by touch. And then finally, in 1900, at 4 p.m. on Thursday, June 30th, a fire broke out among bales of cotton stored on Pier Number 3 of the North German Lloyd Line Steamship Company in Hoboken, New Jersey. Fed by barrels of oil and turpentine, the fire covered an area a quarter of a mile long in less than 15 minutes. Caught in the flames were four of the North German Lloyd Line's ocean liners, the Kaiser Wilhelm de Grasse, the Sail, the Bremen, and the Main. And by the time the blaze was under control, some 160 seamen, longshoremen, and visitors were dead, and three piers that burned of the burned North German Lloyd Line totally destroyed, and three of the four liners were burned out hulls. Property damage was later placed at $2.25 million. That Thursday had been a fairly typical day. The company estimated that about 500 men were working on the piers. The slips on either side of Pier 3 were vacant. The Aller, which had been docked there, had sailed for Naples at 11 a.m., and Pier 2 were the sail due to sail the next day for Boston and then Cherbourg. And the Bremen, at Pier 1, farthest from the source of the fire, were the Kaiser Wilhelm, the pride of the North German Lloyd Line, and the Main. Perhaps as many 200 visitors were on the piers that afternoon, the majority there to inspect the Kaiser Wilhelm, the swiftest of all ocean liners afloat. The speed with which the flames spread prevented the four boats from leaving their berths. None had a sufficient steam to leave under its own power. The Kaiser Wilhelm was the first to get clear, towed out to the river by tugs, President and Sarah E. Easton. Of the four liners, the Kaiser Wilhelm was the only one to escape severe damage and the only one upon which there were no deaths. The fire scorched a streak some 200 feet long on the side and damaged some first-class cabins on deck, but the liner sailed three days later on July 3rd. The other ships and the men working on them were not so lucky. The crews of the Sal and the Bremen, cut off by the raging fires on the piers, cast off lines which moored both ships, but without steam, the boats were left to drift with the tide out to the North River. By then, the, the ships were surrounded by tugs and fireboats, many of from two crews jumped into a river, risking death by water than, rather than by fire. The flames quickly spread across the wooden deck houses and cabins, trapping the crews below deck. Some attempted to squeeze through the portholes on the side of the ships, only to be hopelessly trapped, caught in a cauldron of fire. The main never had a chance to escape from its pier. The fire burned its way lower and lower into the vessel. It was not until 11.30 that evening, some seven and one half hours after the first fire broke out, that the main was finally towed away by tugboat Evan E. Stevens. One of the miracles of the fire occurred after the main was beached, for out of the smoldering wreck came 16 men. They had retreated before the flames in an empty coal bunker in the lowest part of the ship. There below water level, they were at least safe on three sides, although the ceiling grew red hot and the threat of suffocation increased hourly. It was only when the men felt the ship moving away from the pier that they realized that they might escape death. By the next morning, the three piers of the North German Lloyd Line were charred ruins. The Sal, still afire, had partially sunk off Ellis Island. The Bremen, gutted by fire, awaited search crews looking for her dead. What was left of the main had been beached at week when. Crews were already at work on the Kaiser Wilhelm trying to repair the damage caused by fire and water. Early newspaper estimates placed the number of dead close to 400. It was not until some weeks later when the crews had a chance to search the wreckage and drag the harbor area that a more accurate figure of some 160 was established. Some of the dead, 80 in all, were buried in a mass funeral on July 4th at a plot on, purchased by George German Lloyd Line at Flower Hill Cemetery in Hoboken. And finally, a tragic story was not without its grisly afternotes. Charges were levied that the tugboat captains refused to pick up survivors from the water or to lend assistance without the promise of financial gain, and that the cemetery officials improperly interred 80 coffins. You have been listening to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I thank you for listening, and I hope that you have enjoyed learning about historical events from the past. Thank you to the following websites for their information regarding today's topics. ThePeopleHistory.com the Corvette at liveabout.com, Great Britain's 999 emergency number at madeupinbritain.uk, and the New Jersey Ships Fire at postcardhistory.net. The music used as the background track for this podcast is Americana, created by Kevin McLeod on incompetech.com. If you enjoyed this information and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing as this will keep the historical events in your feed in the morning for each day. I hope you have a great day.